Eddie Stern, thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. I'm I'm super thrilled to be here, Kim. Yeah, it's nice to have made a connection with you recently through our good friend Satvir Khalsa and to know that we have some things we might want to talk about. So let's start with your evolution to now, um, because the last couple years, three years, maybe longer, has been a pretty... um, kind of fierce journey for you. Is that an appropriate word? Uh, Define fierce. (laughs) Yeah, fierce, I think I would say like a sort of um, harsh at turns, relentless um, at times. And I mean, unforgiving isn't really the word, but just it, it, it all came at you in the Ashtanga community in a concentrated fashion like it did for many schools it lent many lineages in the last four or five years but as you and I discussed last week um, this was something that was kind of known within the Ashtanga community for a while and has been sort of um, pulling a, pulling it apart at the seams a little bit is that an accurate description well yeah I mean let's um maybe also take one broader step back um which would be that um we, you know, because I've talked about these things a lot over the past couple of years in um, in many different forums, and um, the um, the you know people come into yoga, at least in my generation, because you are on a spiritual quest. You were looking, you were searching, you were seeking, and um, and in an American culture we are spiritually naive. We come into the world of yoga and of Hinduism or Buddhism only through the filters of Judeo-Christian thought because that's the culture that we grew up in. And we, um, and we superimpose those things on top of not Eastern religions, but Eastern ways of being of living and of looking at the world, which are completely different than the way that we look at the world through a Western lens. Mm -hmm. And that's just like a fact. All cultures, they develop to see the world and to develop perceptive sense based on their cultural upbringing, which has been going on for a long time. Our cultural upbringing in America has been going on for a very short time. It's been going on for a couple of hundred years. Uh, in this country, and it's a country, of course, that was um, uh, conceived and evolved in violence, and yeah. are still we're still reenacting the residue of that violence in modern culture today, which we can see by the absolute insane, um, uh, you know, romanticized and enamored view that people have of guns and of military-grade weapons, uh, mass shootings that we don't see in any other country. So, you know, we have to take a look at like, not just, okay, what is it that we're seeking, but how are we seeking? Mm -hmm. And the way that we're seeking might not mesh with the worlds of yoga completely yet. We're we're in the midst of a learning curve. So when we come into, um, into India, and we start adapting particular lifestyles and a new language, um, you know, we bring stuff with us. And um, and we also, in that not understanding of a new culture and, and in a completely different way of looking at the world, which of course we can understand because mm-hmm. it's not our culture, um, th- sometimes there are things we choose not to see. Um, we see them and then we're deciding, well, maybe I didn't really see that or maybe it means something else. And we make excuses where we shouldn't be. Now, we don't just do that with other cultures. We do that within our own cultures as well. In fact, it's one of the things that human beings do when the truth is too hard to handle or you don't want to deal with it or you wish the truth was something other than it was. So rather than looking at whatever happened with Batabi Joyce or whatever happened with Osho or with whatever happened with Bikram or whatever happened with whoever, um, uh, you know, through the lens of this is a problem of the community, You know, uh, Mm -hmm. this is a problem within Ashtanga yoga. This is a problem within, uh, you know, Kripalu yoga, blah, blah, blah. This is a problem with humanity. Um, 
And just because we're doing something that we call yoga or we call meditation doesn't mean that we're not bringing the problems and flaws of humanity into those situations with us. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, and to look at it in with some of those ideas is not to deny or not look at the fact that harm was caused and pain was caused, um, but you know, or how we participated in any of that by being a bystander, for example. Um, but um, you know like this is going on. And so we have to make that part of our investigation. And, and this is what is swadhyaya, you know, self-examination. Self-examination isn't just like, you know, examining the good things about you and, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Self, like I lost some weight today. Self-examination isn't about just recalling your day or, yeah. or those things or what do you want to do different tomorrow. Right. Uh, self-examination is yeah. even limited to one individual mm -hmm. um you know it's it's an examination of the human condition uh the pluses and the minuses the positives and the negatives the things that um you know that need to be fixed that you can actually work on the things that need to be fixed that maybe you can't work on right now uh the things that are up to a collective the things that are up so all of this stuff goes under swadhyaya mm -hmm. under examination so when we look at self-examination and and i generally don't even uh, i rarely define swadhyaya in this sense also because people often think of it as just oh i need to observe myself and, and study myself and it's actually you know there is no individual self mm -hmm. um, we are all participants in this grand something. We don't even know what it is. Right. We have no idea. So, um, so I, know, I know this. And so why do I say all this stuff? Because um, the question that you asked me, if I had answered it in a way where I'd said, yeah, a lot of shit came my way and it was really difficult to deal with. Mm. I don't think that's a good answer. Mm. Uh, and I don't think that that's in. You know, and, and that's an answer I might have given a couple of years ago, but it's not one that I give now because um, the, um, you know, I and we all have choices to make when we're in difficult situations. And sometimes we're in difficult situations where we shut down and we're not able to make the right choices. And, you know, everyone who's born into this world, everyone who's born into the world has some level of trauma. Everybody's traumatized. Being born to be born is to be traumatized. Um, so, and for some people, those levels are very extreme. Some people they're medium. Some people they're moderate. Some people they're extremely mild. Um, and there are different situations that are going to cause you to not be able to, to respond in the way which represents your highest um, aspirations, your truest moralities. Mm -hmm. uh, your absolute sense of right and wrong. Sometimes we lose those things. Sometimes groups lose those things completely and they go insane. And we observe this like again and again and again and again throughout humanity. We shouldn't be too surprised when it happens in spiritual circles. We shouldn't be too surprised when it happens to spiritual leaders mm -hmm. um, because these are, this is part of the human condition. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, I don't know. Uh, none of that was was pre-planned that's just yeah well that's why i wanted to start there and i a couple I, can i ask a clarifying question i love that phrase you use the perceptive sense that we develop can you tell me a little bit about that perceptive. what you meant what i think you said perceptive sense didn't you that we as a culture have developed a, a oh yeah yeah, tell yeah. me a little bit about that because i want to go back there <laughs> i want to pin that but i also want to pin <sighs> this idea that I don't know that we really need to go much farther into it, but the idea that predation is as old as time and what it you is. I don't want to talk about that. That would yeah, be. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think, I think you, I think we, I think we've dealt with that. And, but let's talk about this perceptive sense because I love the idea. And this was exactly what. The reason what, I don't want to talk about predation is mm -hmm. all this time is because mm -hmm. I don't want to give any inkling of uh, mm. the idea because it's as old as time that it's okay and we of should of course it's of course bad, it's wrong it should not be as old as time yeah um, and is time even old yeah, but that's a good question <laughs> I love it. Sense, um okay so all beings perceive in different ways 
human beings perceive different wavelengths of color, different wavelengths of sound, different wavelengths of smell and taste and touch than do other types of animals. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a cat, a dog, a flea, a bat, a worm, a snake, an ant, an octopus uh, who, um, you know, can taste through all of its tentacles, um, you know, a, a snake that sees in um, in uh, heat signatures, a bat mm -hmm. that sees in infrared, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. We have no idea how animals perceive and what the world looks like to um, a mosquito. If only. For example. Um, so sometimes we barely know what the world looks like to a human being, you know, just the way we perceive it. Now, and so these are all things, everybody knows this stuff already, um, you know, and this is basic stuff. Uh, cultures as well, and language is going to shift the way that you think and perceive too. So just because as a human being, we see the same seven colors, we're going to see those same seven colors differently. Um, if you are, you know, born on the East Coast of America, or if you're born in India or Thailand or in France or wherever, your perception of color is going to shift, even though you have that same wavelength. Um, and also, your perception of time is going to be molded by the way your culture views time. In the West, we primarily think of time as a timeline. It's linear. It goes like this. But in the Incan traditions and in Hindu traditions and Buddhism, time is a circle. And it's an infinite loop. And we're too busy marking things from the day that Christ died, you know, till Armageddon. Mm -hmm. And so, that, like, you know, we have a linear thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and, and also how you view space. And space means the people around you as well. Um, so, like, for example, if you think it's okay to carry a gun and think it's okay to stand your ground, then you're going to start perceiving the people around you as a threat. And that means if some young black boy who is 16 years old, and that's why I say a boy, but a young black man rings your doorbell and you shoot him in the head. Um, it's not because you're mentally disturbed. It's because you live in a culture which has taught you to feel threatened if someone comes into your space who's a different color than you. Mm -hmm. So, um, and this is an endemic problem. You know, not everyone's doing it in America, but enough people are doing it to know that this whole idea of stand your ground, that means that we're always constantly turning people into other. A, a country that needs to have that as a law has something deeply wrong with it. So, but what if you live in a country where, in a culture where you don't see other people as other, but you see them as an extension of you and you view yourself as an extension of them? Then you're going to relate to people and treat people very differently. So then your perception of the world and your place in the world will change. And so will your your spatial awareness like spatial awareness is a very important thing because it allows you to know where you stand in relation to the people and things around you and one of the things that yoga does is it helps improve your sense of of, of spatial awareness and mm. also your sense of proprioception where are my limbs in relation to my own body so and where's my own body in relation to the other bodies around me this is one of the cool things about yoga so now if you live in a culture where you develop a wonderful spatial awareness from the time that you're young and you see everyone as your extended family to some degree or et cetera, et cetera, you're going to view humanity very differently than if you view everyone as a threat. Mm -hmm. And um, so imagine if you come from a country which is does has a very limited sense of personal boundaries, mm -hmm. go into a country where there's a very expanded sense of personal boundaries, then um, that, you know, that might be slightly confusing for you and you might get the wrong messages about things. So we have our perceptive senses uh, and our perceptive sense is based in, not solely on the five senses themselves, but how we are trained culturally uh, and in the time period that we we're born into, how we're trained to view the world, how we're trained to view the people around us. And, um, and that's perception. And then I will start to view everything through that lens and everything that comes in is going to have to be refracted through that lens. And that will be what I call reality. Mm -hmm. But all it is is a very limited reality based on time, place, culture and whatever 
karmas or some scars there might be in there, as well as my life experiences. So, you know, it it's interesting and becomes slightly complicated, but there are things that are, you know, and, and we're rarely, rarely super self-reflective about our own cultures when we're interfacing with other cultures, because quite often we assume our perspective is right, right. because we're experiencing it. Because right. I'm experiencing, I think this is the right perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to drop that because this is part of narrative. It's part of our identity. So what is one of the things that uh, yoga uh, addresses? Patanjali talks about this pretty clearly in chapter two, when he talks about asmita or our personal narrative. And the personal narrative um, should begin to thin as we do the different practices of yoga as we do tapas and swadhyaya and ishwara pranidhana, that is going to help thin the kleshas. And one of the strongest of the kleshas is our personal narrative. That's the hardest thing. This is what people often call the ego. Um, you know, Freud had different ideas about the ego than perhaps asmita refers to. Mm -hmm. uh, but one way or the other, it's something that we identify with. Now, what happens when that begins to thin? When it begins to thin, then you can get let other stuff in and then you can begin to view the worlds in, in different types of ways so it's all quite interesting you know and this is one of the nice things or one of the beneficial things about um learning several languages especially when you're young because when you speak in a different language and think in a different language and can go back and forth between them you become different people as you do that and um you become different cultures and then you become culture fluid you know mm -hmm. and in becoming culture fluid you can see that identity and narrative uh, can change depending on time place and circumstance you don't always have to hold on to one so firmly and think that this is your stance because when you hold on to your own narrative and you hold on to a cultural perspective that is an inner stand my ground where the other always is going to become other and becomes threatening to you mm -hmm. so, this is one of the reasons why it's good to, you know, spend time in India if you want to learn yoga uh, and have a little time to release some of the cultural, you know, Western narrative. And when I'm, you know, I'm speaking for Western people, uh, European or American, you know, you spend time in India, um, that can help you go through a little bit of a, a, a narrative shift. And, um, one thing that happens sometimes is you you can take on uh, Indian identity, which won't be completely a true identity, you know, and so you have to be careful of that also be careful of all identities, you know that you can play with them, none of them are real. Uh, and you know, none of them are going to be closer to reality, because uh, the only thing which is close to reality is reality. Yes. But the narratives, you know, the narratives are, um, are, are interesting, maybe some of them can be a little bit um, more reflective of honesty uh, than other narratives, perhaps. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the end of the day, all of the narratives um, have to go away until the only story you have is no story. Um, mm -hmm. And even that idea drops away. So. Exactly, exactly. You know, I, I'm, I'm, when we first, when I first approached you to talk to me about the Ashtanga Yoga lineage, you know, and we had this exchange in which you said, and it's stuck with me ever since, and I really like it and love to unpack it a little bit even now. But, and again, it's like, here I am asking questions that you've already answered. So maybe we could just keep doing it that way for the next 30 minutes. Um, you know, you, you, you said, and you know, paraphrasing here, that I, I don't want to talk about this without a South Asian, at least a South Asian on the call. And so I was like, what about Sherrod? Maybe the two of you could talk about it because what I was interested in and remain interested in is the intersection that you have just addressed for the last several minutes between, you know, Americans or the Western mind taking, studying yoga, the study of the yoga versus the appropriation of the yoga What's the difference between those two? I know it's not that simple, but how we can take in the, you know, sort of effects, how we can take in the effects of the yoga that we have imported into this country, quite obviously to me, and we're 
paying for it. We're buying it. We're consuming it for the most part. Like, what are we doing with it? What, what is it in its best case right now? And what is it, what is it that keeps you up at night with regard to the yoga practice, the yoga, um, the, the inculcation of yoga of many in this country or in the West? Well, I mean, I think, I think people doing yoga is generally a very good thing. Um, and um, there's always the danger of something gets more popular um, and more prolific that it will be mm. message will be dampened in different ways. But I think that generally speaking, yoga is good. Um, and I think generally speaking, people should do yoga. <laughs> and I'm very positive about that. Right. And I'm very positive about uh, the entirety of the yoga traditions. So, um, and did we import it? Um, I mean, I know that Swami Vivekananda came over here on his own accord, and Yogananda came over here also on his own accord. You know, weren't they sponsored though? I thought the whole. I thought they were. They were. I think some wealthy people brought them over. I mean, paid their way, right? That's my understanding. I, in my, that, I, I could could be wrong, but I think that's what happened. So just you know, because it was at the time of that just fascinating late 19th century, early 20th um, search for, and, and I think visionaries truly, who saw on the, around the corner of religion and were like, mm, no, nah, it's just not really gonna work. We'd like to explore more truth via the enlightenment, enlightenment thought via explorations of like universality versus some sort of patriarchal religiosity, just like you said, the sort of linear time, like it just starts with Jesus and, you know, ends with Armageddon. That's my understanding. I can't remember um, if um, Swami Vivekananda was sponsored by someone to come. I know that he was coming for the World Parliament. Of yeah, Religion. Chicago. He didn't, he didn't have an invitation. Um, and um, I know wow. Bhakti Vedanta Prabhupada, he came with just a few rupees in his pocket by ship. He definitely did not have a sponsor mm. and certainly built up something. He 100% came because he had a calling to come over here. Um, but, um, you know, there's been yoga in this country, whether it was yoga as philosophy, as lecture, uh, as chanting, maybe not as much early on as asanas, mm -hmm. it was here and it's been here for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, Americans weren't going to India for teacher trainings at that point and then coming back over here and opening yoga studios. So it looked a little bit different. So yeah. yoga like has been coming here. Um, and all that's just to say that, mm -hmm. you know, whether I'm incorrect or correct about the nature the conditions of Vivekananda or Yogananda coming over here and there were people before them as well um yoga has been coming here for some time and um now it's there's just a lot more of it and there's also a very big commercial aspect to it as well because at a certain point people decided hey I can make money off of this and so I'm gonna uh, back in the 1980s and early 1990s, people were not really making a living teaching yoga. Mm -hmm. um, if a yoga class was five or six dollars at most, and you know, you had 20 people putting five bucks into a hat, right? Uh, basement on Avenue B, that's not a living. Um, so, but then that shifted, and then everything shifted. Um, so, yeah, that, that's just how it goes. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's changed. So, so yoga has been coming here for a while and, um, and now it's just coming over a little bit different mm -hmm. and it's a little bit out of control, probably. Um, yeah. What do you, yeah, let's, yeah, let's because it, it, it's, it's so interesting talking to you because I mean, all the, you know, all the guests I bring onto this show and starting with the yoga lineages conversations, you know, two years ago, more than two years ago now, um, I wanted to talk to you because they've established themselves as thought leaders, practitioner leaders, thought leaders, people who've been at it for a long time, who have seen a lot change in their lifetime, who have something to say a little bit about this sort of history, the story the narrative to your point of how we got to this point. 
And especially because of these many inflection points that COVID brought about for those of us walking around with some explicit moral and ethical commitment via this practice that we've taken on, where are we going? What are we doing with it? And what you're doing with it is amazing because you're about to have a master's or a PhD or both. Didn't you just defend? No, you just presented your thesis or did what happened on Tuesday last uh, week? Yeah, I, I, um, I handed in my dissertation last Congratulations. week. Congratulations. That's so great. Yeah. So you've handed in your dissertation. You've decided to thank academic basically on this yoga journey. So can we talk a little bit about that in the context of the question I just asked, which is what are you doing <laughs> with all of this? <laughs> and where are you taking it? Because you've got this Sangha, you've been at this for so long. I mean, 40, 30, almost 40 years, 35. And so tell me where you're taking it. Tell me what's going, what's happening. It's just happening, you know, it's just, it's just happening. Um, yeah. We, um, I, you know, I like doing stuff. I always have. And I think I, I have somewhat of a, a creative spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, when something interests me, I, um, I pursue it. And I think that's really all there is to it. You know, like a few years ago, I had this idea um, for uh, making a, a breathing app with my friend, Sergey. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'd drawn pictures of what I thought would be a good app to guide people in resonance frequency breathing because I couldn't find anything, even though that type of breathing was around and well established as being good for cardiovascular health and for stress. But there wasn't anything I saw that was like a nice app or a good app or even an app at all. Uh, there wasn't much on YouTube to breathe along with. You had to look at a clock or listen just to the bells of um, Richard Brown, which didn't quite work for me because they were a little too jarring. Mm. So we, um, but he, he's a leader in the field of, of coherence breathing. And uh, so I built an app for basically no money with my friend, Sergey, and we released it uh, for free. We don't collect any data on it. We don't even collect your email address. Hmm. And right now we have on a couple of different platforms, a hundred thousand monthly users, well over half a million downloads. And, um, and the things like going strong, just because I had an idea, I thought it would be good to do. So I went ahead and, and I did it. And I, you know, I did it with, with, with care and, and, and we were very careful with stuff. Um, now, and it's really interesting because one of the, um, one of the primary breath ratios that is used in resonance frequency is inhaling for five seconds and exhaling for five seconds or inhaling for four and exhaling for six. So you're breathing six times in a minute. Um, just last week, a paper came out about this particular ratio, and this was in Nature Magazine, which is a very good journal, um, that breathing like that for 20 to 40 minutes a day is a preventative for Alzheimer. And it's, you know, ridding the brain of the different types of amyloids that build up um, through, um, through, you know, daily life and stress and primarily through thinking, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of thoughts that, um, and in this particular breathing ratio it helps to clear those amyloids from the brain through something called the glymphatic system. Um, and so this is very interesting. And there's all sorts of research which comes out all the time about these particular ratios, which is a, a very natural way of breathing when you're meditating um, within certain pranayama practices, within certain yoga practices. Um, it's just something w which we've already experienced in yoga. And now they're researching it in different ways and finding very important and life enhancing applications to it. I find this very interesting. I'm very interested in participating in this world. Uh, and now with the breathing app, we're making a new breathing app right now that we're going into beta testing next month uh, for diabetes specifically, hmm. um, different practices and light movement um, to support relief of symptoms associated with diabetes. And um, 
we're doing a, another one as well as geared towards hypertension too. Uh, so, you know, I think it's good if you, if you want to participate in these worlds, you should be educated. I never went to university. So um, I went to India close out of high school. So I thought, you know, if I want to be researching stuff and working with research teams, I should learn how to be a researcher myself. So that's one of the reasons why I decided to apply to school and get a master's. I did, thank God I was able to skip doing a bachelor's because that's four years and who has the time, frankly. But, um, but two that's years great. I can do. And um, also, you know, there's, if I have, you know, if, if I think I'm up to it, I'll try to do a PhD next, take a year off and research and study and continue to do the stuff I'm doing. And then maybe I'll go in for a PhD. But, you know, there's also a lot of stuff in the um, academia world of yoga where there are things being um, suggested and put forward that I don't think are accurate and that a lot of people don't think are accurate. And um, so, and I think that in order to debate these things on the same level as the academics who are putting these ideas forward, then you also right. need to be, you have to go through the same amount of schooling, at least have the same types of letters, most likely after your name, so that um, you can say, well, yes, I also <laughs> have a PhD or I also have this, that or the other. And so based on, you know, my research and my looking into it, and what these traditions say, here's where that might not be accurate. Mm -hmm. It's not enough for a yoga teacher to say, that's wrong, you know, but it is something for, uh, you know, someone who has a doctorate and those things to say, that might be wrong and here are some reasons why. And then you're operating on a different level. Mm -hmm. So for those reasons, basically I thought, you know, let's just see if I can do it, you know, let's do, who knows, how hard could it be? Maybe really hard, maybe not so hard. Maybe it's just time, you know, right. um, so. Which we're, which we're not sure is old or new or has any exactly. necessarily any significance anyway. And I, it, well, and you know, it's interesting because I, that, that makes me think about the impact and the influence that you're hoping your work to have because if you are debating these concepts, having these conversations, well, let me back up a step. You, the level of conversation, the nature of the debate and conversation changes if you're at the table with those same letters or similar letters or whatever. And therefore those conversations will reach people who don't, can't assess you in any other way than via a quick look at your, background, your pedigree, whatever. And then the conversation itself becomes something of impact or influence because somebody like me, for example, from the outside would just sit and listen to the conversation and decide what I believed or what I thought was right or wrong or different or how it was that I would want to assess the value of yoga or what yoga is in this society. And it makes me think a lot about how many yoga teachers there are who, and this is frankly, one of the main reasons that I started the Yoga Lineages Project in the first place was because I kept having these conversations with yoga teachers in the sort of heat of lockdown COVID from all over the world. As Sapir and I were doing these scientific research you know, webinars, we did like 70. And people were so happy to know that there is research to back up what they feel is true or what they have experienced as true. And so is that what you mean when you say, I wanna live in the world or I'm going, is that why science, why research? Like, is that why you took that direction and not, I don't know, I'm trying to think of another choice you could have made, is that why? Well, I had, the, I had this other choice that I, was making for 20 years, which was, mm -hmm. I'm only doing yoga as a spiritual practice. I'm right. not thinking of anything else. You know, I'm thinking of the practice I'm doing is the best practice one person could possibly do. Yeah. And I was all in for, you know, the spiritual thing. And I still am all in for the spiritual thing. But um, 
I now I'm also adding in the science and research thing too, as oh, part okay. of you know, look, Newton, he was, um, he discovered the laws of gravity, or at least, you know, wrote them down. And he also was um, one of the uh, sort of authors of calculus. Um, but he was also a, um, an alchemist. And he has a tremendous amount of writings on alchemy and metaphysics and all these things. So, you know, when you look at Da Vinci as well, Da Vinci, and not comparing, I'm not comparing myself to these, to these uh, people. I'm saying, if you look to earlier times, um, we will find many, many examples of the crossover of science and spirit. Plato, Aristotle, um, you know, we, you name them, you can just keep going. Um, so, and at a certain point, those two worlds started separating off for each, from each other. And they started breaking into different camps thinking one is, you know, living in the clouds. And then the other one, these are people who are just living in their numbers. And both of them are wrong. You know, if you're living in numbers, it's a construct. If you're living in the clouds, you're not in reality. And how did these two worlds break off from each other where in earlier times, you know, and definitely within the Hindu tradition, you know, there's, there's a tremendously rich tradition um, of, of within architecture and the building of temples and the carving of deities and the mapping of the planets and astrology and the Vedas and, um, you know, sacred geometry of yantras. And, you know, it's immense, immense crossover science and, mm -hmm. and spirituality for lack mm -hmm. of a better word and that's still intact in so many ways in india where it's not intact in the west where those two things have broken off so i think yeah. that i've um uh, you know started um in myself merging those two worlds for a more holistic view of how I want to understand yoga, how I want to teach it. Mm -hmm. and, um, but also, and, you know, as I said before, and, and as I've said many times in the past, we all, we're all participants in the world. We all live here. That means we're participating in this world. Um, even if you live off the grid in the forest, you are participating by breathing. You're taking in what the trees give off. You're putting back stuff for the trees to breathe. Your body is going to decompose one day uh, into the earth. You are a participant in the cycle of nature. We all are. And we all, not consciously all the time, but many of us can choose or decide how we want to participate. And to choose how you want to participate in the world is basically one of the first steps of a contemplative life. This is how I want to participate. This is how I don't want to participate. Um, this is how I want to be of service. This is how I want to be of use. Um, this is how I want to be during my time here. That's the mystical life. That's the contemplative life. That's the spiritual life. Maybe it's the human life. So how do you want to participate? That's an important thing to think about. And a lot of times people come to a spiritual practice because they want to participate differently. Uh, I don't want to behave like that anymore. I want to behave different. Uh, I want I'm doing things that are not making me happy. And other people I'd like to make other people happy and myself happy too. Um, what do I have to change? Mm -hmm. So and, and I see that because I have been doing these practices for over three decades now, and, you know, time is uh, the time I spent practicing is yeah. in, um, indicative of of more authority. It just means that, you know, you've seen stuff change uh, and then you want to perhaps either say, I'm not going to participate in the, the way the yoga world is shaping because I don't agree with it. I'm just going to stay here, do my thing, train my people. Awesome. That's great. And then other people might say. I want to participate in this and, and help maybe guide, maybe not help guide the direction, but let me be a part of the direction it's going with other people. And um, 
and maybe I can be of use somehow. Maybe I can learn things from the people who are coming into it now that I hadn't thought about before. Mm. And then as I participate in this world, I'll learn new things about yoga and about myself and about humanity and about evolving that I I couldn't learn in my generation because my generation was too stuck on things. Now, um, so what are some examples of that? Satbir Singh Khalsa is a very good example of someone who's participating in the world of yoga in an absolutely brilliant way. And there are many, many people doing that. Um, and uh, But he is definitely uh, a leader in that field of the crossover of yoga, spirituality, and engaging in ways um, where the educational knowledge he's bringing to the world can help a lot of people. Now, um, when I was growing up, the generation of comedians that I grew up with like Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy and Steve Martin and, um, you know, all those guys, humor was filled with racism and with misogyny and with homophobia and with, you know, extremely foul language. And like that was humor for us, sadly. across. Which is why Gilda Radner dressed up like the little girl in the rocking chair was more brilliant in like ways than we could count. Right. That was her approach. She was just like, okay, you're going to treat me this way. I'll roll like that. Anyway. So (laughs) it was amazing. RIP. I mean, yeah. So, okay. So then my daughter who's 23 now, she went to Lycée Francais in in New York and um, she, you know, I quickly found that by the time she was going into middle school, even high school, the things that I had found funny growing up were now, they had been trained in such a way that those things were not funny anymore because they were actually mean. Mm -hmm. And so there was no humor anymore in racism, even though I'm from a Jewish family, even telling Jewish jokes weren't funny anymore. (laughs) Um, So um, I started understanding that here is a generation of, of youth growing up where the things that we used to find funny that were actually mean were no longer accepted and other things that we used to have to try to accept um, were absolutely accepted. There was no question about them. Um, Sexual preference, transgender, any of the things related to sexuality that maybe before we thought, oh, um, you know, I'm progressive because I have gay friends or something like that. There's nothing progressive about it. Engaged. <laughs> right. I haven't thought about that. So you're right. But people yeah. used to think it was like, yeah. oh God. Yeah. So, right. you know, so they, you know, so there's there's a whole different way that the this generation and you know the generations that will come after them are evolving to be better people in the world that us Gen Xers can learn from. Totally. And, we have, and, they, and we have to totally. be willing, not just willing, we have to be enthusiastic about learning from them and kind of seek them out so that we can be better people. Because we're not just going to be better people from, you know, reading Ramana Maharshi books. Um, we're <laughs> gonna, we're yeah. going to be better people by understanding the evolving nature yeah. of generation to generation. It's like what you said before, what they see. You know, you were, we were saying earlier, you don't know how like a snail sees the world and we don't even know how we see the world, but you know, looking at the world through their point of view, it's not unlike, you know, the, the Krishnamurti thing. I've said this on this podcast a couple of times before that, and back to Sapir, you know, he was like, I just want to work with people whose minds have been blown by yoga. Right. I mean, and just one of my mind blowing moments was reading his think on these things early on, like my, I don't know, late twenties or something. And he said, just wake up every day as a practice and try to look at everything you see for the first few minutes, the people that you live with, or that you're with at that time, like you don't know anything about them you've seen them for the very first time oh my god right i mean i guess i'm sorry if i'm cutting you off but what you're you're saying about your daughter is exactly what i mean i completely agree (laughs) anyway please keep going (laughs) yeah no that's all so i mean that's participating yeah exactly okay yes exactly which is where we were so you know i'm down for that i'm really interested in that i want to be a part of that because um yeah 
he, you know, because I came into all this because I was curious and I don't want my curiosity yeah. to go away. And um, so my curiosity is also with studying ancient texts, but it's also with being a part of what's happening in the world right now and um in in and not thinking oh those kids you know it was so much better when i was um, you know passing out in front of cbgb's on my skateboard or what <laughs> well yes there's that <laughs> there, there was that part too those tell me was that but those days were pretty good too <laughs> indeed <laughs> so well and so Ah, there's so many good questions and you make me want to live in New York again, <laughs> where I got my start with the integral yoga people, as I was telling you, and you were getting your start around that time, it looks like with the Shivananda, but maybe were the Shivananda people, were you up there with the Shivanandas or did you go down to the Bahamas to study with them? What was that? What? Oh, no, I didn't go to the Bahamas. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, no, that's, you don't go to the Bahamas to learn yoga. Well, Shivananda people do, right? Because there's that ashram down there. I know that some people okay. did. Somebody. It. I'm making it. Oh. Oh. oh, I see. Right, right. <laughs> see, I should have stayed on that vibe. <laughs> um, so I was, going, I was going to 24th Street. Oh. I was going up to the Yoga Ranch and then pretty, I mean, look, I was uh, 1986. I graduated from high school. 1988, I went to India. So, um, and uh, and that was in December of 1988. So, That's so courageous. I mean, it really. Maybe you don't feel like it's that. Six. So there's a year and a half yeah. between high school and going to India was a year and a half. And in that time period, uh, yeah, I was going to Shivananda and I was going to Jiva Mukti Yoga Society and I was going to Dharma Mitra, Ravi Singh's Kundalini Yoga. I wasn't going to Integral Yoga and um, uh, only because I didn't know about it. And um, and that's what I did. And I did all that stuff. I went to Kripalu. Amrit Desai was still there. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I was fascinated. I thought this is what I want to do with my life. And so I went to India. You know, that was it. I completely, I mean, I, I was thinking earlier, I was talking about, thinking about um, earlier in the conversation you were talking about, you know, why people go, oh, come into yoga. You know, they have these behaviors that they're exhibiting or they know aren't working for them and they just want to behave or be different. And I was thinking about my own um, entry into it. It was really trauma and curiosity. Those were the two driving intersecting forces for me. It was curiosity that came from a lot of trauma. As I was growing up, I just looked to learn, which of course had its had a lot of disassociative qualities, but then the curiosity of yoga forced me to embody. So I was like, oh my God, this works so well, you know? And, and so now you're doing this series with Deepak Chopra, which is frankly kind of next level. <laughs> and it seems like it's gonna be really a next level in so many different ways and so many, I mean, it's a coastal thing because he's in California still, right? I and mean, does he split his time or? Oh, is he, he lives in New York. He lives in New York. Oh, I thought he was in LA. Sorry. I thought he, he, I, he moved to New York some years ago. Okay. So, okay. So still coastal because you're on the coast and tell me what's the, what's the, what are you hoping to get out of that? What does he want to get? I mean, I know you can't, maybe can't speak for him, but what are you doing there? What are you hoping to achieve? Well, he and I have been collaborating for a decade now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I propose this lecture series to him. Great. To um, in order to do a couple things. One, uh, his foundation, the Chopra Foundation, does a lot of good work for suicide prevention and um, also for yoga research. And it always needs funding. So I thought, what if we do a lecture series and try to raise some money for the foundation so you can continue you know, with the stuff that you do. Um, and then also, he used to give regular talks in New York when there, he had his home base at ABC Carpets, but that no longer exists. And so we have the temple here, we have space, and I thought it would be nice to give him a spot where he could do regular talks in New York. And um, we're covering the eight limbs of yoga through eight months, and then the last month will be general question and answer type of stuff. I discuss the each of the limbs we go through from a traditional perspective, he from a contemporary, uh, Deepak Chopra inflected um, perspective and Good. have an hour and a half conversation about it and do little meditative practices as well. And so basically the idea is, um, you know, 
um, build community, um, keep a, a, a long ranging conversation going. Cause a lot of times maybe you, right. you know, go somewhere to speak, you give a lecture, yep. and then you're done. Uh, but what happens if that lecture goes on for nine months? You know, what does that look like then? What are the learnings that you might take away from it then? So, right. so that was the basic idea. And um, we're inviting a lot of different people from different um, walks of life in New York City, but primarily black and brown healing and yoga communities and activists to be here for those lectures. And, um, you know, we have about 50% of the people are invited guests from healing and activist communities. And then 50% of the people are, are paid um, guests. They pay $35 for a ticket mm. on limits by donation. And, um, you know, we were looking for sponsors to help bring in bigger dollars um, for the foundation. Those sadly did not materialize, mm. but, um, you know, who knows, maybe something will materialize before it's all over. And, uh, and then that's scoop. Then we put these things up for people to watch and we hope it's educational. That's great. Put them up to watch. Where are they going to be? Um, on your website. site, on his, both? Where? My website. Your website. All right. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the reasons that, of course, I wanted to, I mean, I wanted to make sure we talked about that part because, again, <laughs> everybody I'm talking to has got a bunch of stuff going on. And that's the thing that, again, it seems to me we have so many interesting opportunities right now to amplify the high quality, and I, I, I really, except when I'm thinking about Jurassic Five, I, I, I struggle with that, the quality part. Do you know what I mean? That the, the, the album is so good. But because I'm not sure exactly what that means, but I'm just gonna say it because that's the word that comes to mind and what I use, and I haven't found a better one, science-backed yoga work that <laughs> there's so much, I mean, just the idea that this breathing that you're talking about can actually have the same efficacy in hypertension patients as drugs. You know, the idea that- It might not have the same efficacy, but it- There's it, a study, Sapir and I have put out, a, have, have talked about that before he has, and I've, you know, moderated the conversation. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, because, you know, not all medication works for all people, but not all breathing works for all people. Too. Totally. No, totally. And that, of course, is where I think the frontier is going now. The thing that Sapir and I talked about for, you know, years at this point now is that this burgeoning field of, of, of scientific research on yoga really needs to get more specific. But the only way it's going to get more specific, the only way we're going to really create trials and other types of study, randomized control trials and studies that test a specific kind of breathing for a certain kind of person at a certain time in life, you know, all those things is if there's more money, because there's no way we're going to be able to get more specific without more studies. And we don't get more studies without more money. Right. And to me, it seems like that's the way we need to keep pushing. Yeah. Um, there's um, one of the things about um, something like slow breathing and the effect that it's having on the um, adrenergic branch of the nervous system as a down-regulating, um, mediating factor is that the effects of it are systemic. Mm -hmm. And drugs are very targeted and localized, but the mm -hmm. effects of something like slow breathing are systemic. And so that's why it's a little more challenging to try to pin some of these things down uh, with the specificity that you'll see for testing medications and things like that. So I am, um, you know, uh, I'm, I would like to say I'm new to the research world, even though I've been working in the research world since 2010 or 11, when I did my first study with Marshall Hagens and Sutbeer um, on um, prehypertensive conditions in African Americans, and we did see a good reduction in um, in mercury levels, not quite to the level of hypertension medication, but close enough to say this is does right. something. Right. 
But there are other systemic effects that medication doesn't give that the practice of yoga does give. So that's why it's in, you know, you, even when you talk to Satbir or you talk to Holger Kramer, you know, they basically say yoga basically works, you know, and, um, and the thing is, is to be able to figure out what's going to work for different types of people. Mm -hmm. um, so then if you look at, you know, medicine also, or, or being a doctor, it's, um, you know, the, the practice of medicine is also considered an art. Um, and that's how it's described in medical school. It's not something that I'm making up. So that's why it's a practice and you have to figure things out all the time and make adjustments. And um, based on uh, research and efficacy and you know what has come before you and it's an evolving field. So I think that we have to look at the, the teaching of yoga in therapeutic se settings for medical conditions whether they're physical or psychological right in that same kind of a way that you have to understand the person you have to understand the variety of practices and understand what might work for them based on your knowledge and what has been tested and tried in the field um, which might require looking at yoga research in different types of ways yeah. um, and so to study whether or not Ardhamat Sendriyasana is going to have an effect on blood sugar level and look at one posture and look at one outcome, okay. that probably isn't the thing to do because yoga was never taught um, as a single modality intervention, but a multi-modality intervention. Exactly. And one of the also one of the really interesting things, and this is what I've been looking at lately, and what I plan to look at more over the next year, and it's um, a little bit what my dissertation is touching on. Not completely though, but that um, there is evidence emerging as well that yoga works better when there is education and practice of yamas and niyamas mm. and this is really cool stuff coming out that um you know the asanas and pranayama and relaxation and meditation work but they actually work a lot better when the ethical and moral considerations are studied and practiced now isn't that cool wow. i mean that's super cool so then you enter a whole other way of looking at what then is going to be an intervention of yoga for back pain? Um, it's going to be education in ahimsa and satya and pramacharya and aparigraha and asteya, or in the proper order as well. <laughs> I mean, santosha, santosha, you know, very good thing to be educated in when you're dealing with stress and totally. dealing. So, um, so, you know, that's. That's cool stuff that's happening out there. And um, uh, I think the, this is a little bit more the direction I'm gonna start to go. I wrote my dissertation on, the title of it was, um, Can Yoga Reduce Anxiety and uh, Increase Perception of Purpose in Life? Because yoga is supposed to align us with our purpose, with personal dharma. And so, um, can it reduce anxiety? Yes, it can to some degree. Um, but is that the purpose of yoga? No, mm -hmm. the purpose of yoga is something different. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that people push back against the yoga people who say, well, how can you study transcendence? How can you study, you know, you actually can. I would say ask Sapir. He's got a, he's got about 10 or 15 studies. He could just surface <laughs> right now. <laughs> You can, and there's a lot of there's a lot of research on it, and it's very yeah. interesting. And yeah. so, so you know, let's see if we can uh, make some correlation or association between um, a change happening on one level, and, but then does it also make this other thing more emergent? Um, because you know, these like uh, the the complexity theory and emergent theories and things like this are very interesting and 
you know, self-organizing uh, systems of knowledge or self-organizing principles of consciousness that we hear a lot about um, these days. Uh, my friend Neil Thies has written a, an amazing book on it called Complexity Theory, which just came out. And um, the, um, so, you know, how, how do things arise and what conditions allow for things to arise? Asanas and pranayama and the pratyahara that could arise from it, and even dharana, dhyana, and samadhi are condition setters. Mm. They prepare a field for kaivalya. Samadhi is not the end point. And the eight different types of samadhi are not the end point of yoga. They are the condition setters for kaivalya. And so, and also yama and niyama are condition, they're, they, they're priming the field for something to emerge, for an emergent, innate emergent property to express itself. Um, it, this is fairly apparent from looking at the, you know, the yoga texts that, you know, one thing doesn't cause something to happen because, you know, the, because the universe is a causeless place or consciousness is a causeless entity. Hmm. So one thing's not going to cause enlightenment. Um, but conditions can be created for the thing which already exists to emerge and make itself apparent. Um, so, you know, in I, one view, in one view. Well, I wish that we could spend another three hours talking about all these other views, but Eddie Stern, I think that is a great place to end because, and you might've seen me scribbling as I've gone through, um, <laughs> you know, just moments that I think are clippable and able to be sent out. And the, and I'm really happy that we spent a few minutes extra because you packed a punch there in the last six or seven minutes. <laughs> it was really great. I, I really uh, look forward to being connected with you at, you know, whenever our paths cross again. And I'm absolutely certain that this conversation will be inspiring and directive for people, which is the point of the podcast anyway. Thanks for having me on. It was a pleasure talking to you. And, um, you know, with the COVID, I could be completely, absolutely 100% wrong about everything that I've said. Uh, and in <laughs> of, I completely 100% change my views. But, uh, you know. It's like the legal writer at the bottom of this, right? Like, no, no one can be held responsible for saying anything in this conversation. I hear yeah. you and I completely understand that. Uh, the hashtag curiosity, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Curiosity, participation. And, um, you know, and uh, it's hard to even keep an open mind when you don't know what you're keeping an open mind about. Totally. Oh, <laughs> so many things in. like. Just, just dig in. Touch dig in it. what's happening and, and study the texts. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And wait and see what happens. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, so much for uh, for spending time with me today. My pleasure. <laughs>